A significant part of statistics is testing a claim to see if we can really believe it's true. So that's going to be our question for the day, is how do we test a claim? And today we're going to specifically focus on a claim for a proportion. The process we're going to talk about, though, does work for all sorts of claims. But specifically today, we're going to stay in the context of a proportion. The way we test claims in statistics is what is called hypothesis testing. And the idea behind hypothesis testing is it's this clear process we can do to test if a claim is true. What we'll do is we'll first set up two hypotheses. And they're going to be contradictory hypotheses. Either the first one or the second one is true. The first one we'll call h sub 0. That is what we will call the null hypothesis. And it will always include, it will always use equals, some variable equals something. And another thing about the null hypothesis is we will always assume the null hypothesis is true until proven otherwise. If the null hypothesis is not true, the other hypothesis is h sub a, which we call the alternate hypothesis. And this is often what we're trying to show to disprove a claim. And this will either use greater than, less than, or not equal to, kind of the alternative choice. If it's not equal to a number, it must be different than it. And then once we've set up those two hypotheses, we will run a sample or an experiment. And then based on that experiment, we will calculate the probability the null hypothesis, hypothesis is true based on our sample. This calculation that the null hypothesis is true based on our sample is what we will call the p-value. It's going to be very important to us, the p-value. What is the probability the null hypothesis is true based on our sample? Once we know that probability, we will compare it to the all-important alpha. Alpha, actually no period, we'll just say or, the smallest probability that we will still believe the null hypothesis is true. So if our probability, our p-value, is smaller than alpha, that is too small of a probability to still believe the null hypothesis. And so we will have to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative because our p-value was too small. It was smaller than alpha. The smallest probability we still believe the null hypothesis is true. Or the p-value might be bigger than alpha. There is a greater probability that it is actual, the null hypothesis is true. And then we won't reject the null hypothesis. So step five is simply 
either two, make me a little more space. We will either reject the null hypothesis And we do that if the p-value is less than alpha, because the probability was too small to still believe the null hypothesis. Or we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. And that's the case where the p-value is greater than alpha, or it's just too big of a probability to believe that the null hypothesis is false. A great example to kind of show how hypothesis testing works is to consider a trial. In the United States, we assume in a trial that a person is innocent until proven guilty. And it's actually a perfect statistical hypothesis test. Let's say person A is accused of a crime. The null hypothesis that everyone assumes is true until proven otherwise is that person A is innocent. The alternative hypothesis, what we try and prove or find enough evidence, is that the person is guilty. And what we always do is we assume innocent until proven that proof is the p-value. What is the probability that they're innocent, given there's all this proof that they are guilty? And not just proof that they're guilty, because you never know for sure they're guilty. We just prove they're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And that reasonable doubt that is the alpha. If you go beyond alpha, if p-value gets smaller than alpha, the proof of innocent is so small, we can no longer assume they're innocent. And there's actually two conclusions that we can make. If proven guilty, If the p-value is so small that they're innocent, the probability they're innocent is so small it's beyond a reasonable doubt, we reject the null hypothesis. And conclude the defendant is guilty. If not, at least not beyond a reasonable doubt, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude, and this is where it gets interesting and it's very important in statistics, we don't conclude they're innocent. We conclude that they are not guilty. The conclusion focuses on the alternative hypothesis. What's key there is that we never conclude the null hypothesis, h sub 0, is true. We just failed to conclude the alternative. We didn't say they were innocent. We just said there's not enough evidence to say they're guilty. And that's an important uh, conclusion that applies to statistical conclusions as well. We will never conclude the null hypothesis is true. We will always conclude that the alternative hypothesis could not be proven or could be proven.
Speaking of conclusions, let's talk about how we want to make our conclusions. Similar to how we interpreted a confidence interval for a proportion, when we make a conclusion, it's really important we make that conclusion in context. But we also are going to focus on the alternative hypothesis, the h sub a. And so a nice script we can follow is we will say there is or there is not, depending on the context. We will say not if we fail to reject. We did not get the alternative hypothesis like we wanted. So there, there is or there is not sufficient evidence to conclude whatever we can conclude. The conclusion, though, is always going to be the alternative or the alternate hypothesis. in context to the problem. Let's do two examples where we can really see what this hypothesis testing thing looks like. Example. First, for doing uh, hypothesis tests specifically with proportions, everything we've done so far actually applies to all hypothesis testing. But specifically with proportions, there's a few formulas we need for proportions. First off, we know that proportions are normally distributed with the proportion acting as the mean and the square root of pq over n acting as the standard error. But as you calculate these values, different than a confidence interval, because a confidence interval focused on the sample and what we could learn from the sample, we used p and q from the sample. Here, we're focusing on a null and an alternate hypothesis. So we're going to focus on the claim that the null hypothesis is true. Use the null hypothesis values. And then to calculate our p-value or our probabilities, we will have z is equal to p hat, the sample proportion, minus p, the hypothesized proportion, divided by the standard error. And remember, the standard error is the square root of pq over n. So let's try this. Let's say a phone company claims that 43% of smartphone users have an iPhone. But you doubt this claim. So you conduct a survey. of 83 smartphone users. Forty-four of them use an iPhone. What can you conclude? 
if alpha equals 0 0.05. In other words, we're going to believe the claim of 43% until the probability dips below 5% that that claim is actually true. Well, let's set this up. Our null hypothesis has to be that our proportion equals something. And that's the claim that the proportion equals 0.43. For the alternative hypothesis, we can either say the proportion is greater than, less than, or not equal to. There's no direction given in your doubt. When you doubt 43% is accurate, you're not saying that it's greater or less than. You just doubt that it's accurate. So this is going to actually be not equal to 0.43. And when it's not equal to 0.43, we have what's called a two-tailed test. And what that means is we could reject the null hypothesis if the proportion is bigger or if the proportion is smaller, either direction. Maybe it'd be easier to see if we drew a picture. And we're going to annotate this picture as we go on. Here's the normal curve for the proportion. The claim is that the mean, the proportion is 0.43. But we doubt that's true. We think it's either going to be lower, somewhere in the red tail on the left, or higher, somewhere in the red tail on the right. We don't know which side. We just doubt it. It's in both tails, left and right. The distribution, then, of the proportion, just to review, we know that the proportion of our sample will be normally distributed. And again, we're going to use the null hypothesis here. Around the claim of 0.43, with a standard error of 0.43, that's our p, times q, 1 minus 0.43 is 0.57, over my sample size. And here we did a survey of 83 people. So what that really means is our proportion is normally distributed with a mean of 0.43 and a standard error of 0.0543. So what is our sample proportion? Well, our sample proportion is going to be x divided by n, or the 44 out of 83 people who use the iPhones. And that's going to be 0.53. Run out of color, so we'll go back to blue. Actually, one thing to put in, since we know our proportion is 0.53, on my picture off to the right, I'm going to put 0.53. That is the x value where the red shading starts. We don't know the value on the left. If our proportion had ended up being less, we would have put the number on the left. But because our proportion was more, we put it on the right. Now we're ready to calculate our z value. And z is our sample proportion minus the hypothesized proportion divided by the standard error. So 0.53, the sample, minus the hypothesized 0.43, divided by the standard error of 0 0.0543. The z value there is 1.84. So if we have x's on top, we'll stick z's down below. I should have left a little more space. When it's a z, we assume the mean is 0, and our value on the table is 1.84. So let's go to the table and see what area goes with a z value of 1.84. On the table, we're looking at 1. 0.84. So if I scroll over 
And if I draw my line straight, we see 1.84 corresponds to an area of 0 0.4671. But remember, with that area of 0 0.4671, that is the area in white, 0 0.4671. We are interested in the area in the tail. To get the tail, we have to subtract from 0.5. That'll give us 0 0.0329. But what's important to know is because this is a two-tailed test, we have to consider the other tail as well is 0 0.0329 as well. It's symmetrical, which is nice. So when we want to calculate the p-value, The p-value is the total shaded area. Because this is a two-tailed test, we have to add them together. The point 0, 0.0329 plus point 0, 0.0329, that gives us a p-value of 0, 0.0658. And remember that p-value is the probability our null hypothesis is true based on our survey. In other words, based on our survey, there is a, change it to a percentage, 6.58% chance the proportion of iPhone users is actually 43%, what the null hypothesis claims. Now, at first glance, you might say that's not a very large percent. But remember, we did say up at the top here that alpha is 0.05. And that means we will continue to believe the null hypothesis is true as long as the probability does not dip below 5%. So if the p-value is 6%, that's not below the 5% threshold, we say that still is not quite enough evidence to kick out the null hypothesis. So our decision is we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. Because there's just not quite enough evidence. It was close, but not quite enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. The reason for that really clearly stated is the p-value, the probability the null hypothesis is true, is greater than that alpha that minimum threshold. Putting the numbers in there, the p-value is 0 0.0658. That is greater than the alpha of 0 0.05. So we failed to reject, and we're ready to make our conclusion. Following our script, then, we will say that there is not, because we failed to reject, we'll say not, sufficient evidence to conclude. And the conclusion must be in context of the alternative hypothesis. So we're going to state the alternative hypothesis that the proportion's not 43%. Of course, we must put it in context. So to conclude the proportion of iPhone users is different than 43%. Now, one thing you might notice is there's a couple of P's going on in here in problems like these. And it's very important we keep them all straight. 
we have a p value. That's just the probability the null hypothesis is true. We have a p in the null hypothesis. That is the claim for the population proportion. And we also have a p hat. That is the sample proportion. Be very careful not to get the three p's mixed up. Quite often, we'll see students compare the wrong p to alpha. And they'll make the wrong conclusion as a result. Make sure you compare the p-value to alpha to make a conclusion about your p based on your p-hat. Sounds confusing, but practice a few to make sure you get them straight. Just to kind of make this interesting, and this isn't always required, but it often is with a hypothesis test, is let's make a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion based on our sample. So based on our sample p hat, our sample we said was 53%, which means q hat, the opposite of that is going to be 1 minus that, or 47%, 0.47. And if we're doing a 95% confidence interval, we should know the z sub alpha over 2, or z sub 0 0.05 over 2, or z sub 0 0.025 is equal to 1.96. And we found out in our previous lesson that the error is equal to that z value of 1.96 times the square root of pq over n. But with the confidence interval, notice I will use the sample data. This is different than the hypothesis test where we use the hypothesis. With the confidence interval, we use the sample data of 0.53 times 0.47 divided by the sample size, which was 83. And that will give me an error of 0.10. Seven. So my confidence interval then is the proportion 0.53 minus the error of 0.107 and the sample proportion of 0.53 plus the error of 0.107, giving me a confidence interval for the true population proportion to be between 0.423 and 0.637. Or in context, we're saying that we are 95% confident the true population proportion of iPhone users always put it in context, is between 42.3% and 63.7%. And what you notice is, with that confidence interval, our null hypothesis said what we were assuming to be true. The null hypothesis said the proportion was equal to 0.43. Notice that 43% is within that confidence interval. That's why we cannot reject it, because it still is a valid possibility for the true population proportion of iPhone users. I want to do one more example. I know this video is running a little bit longer than normal, but it's really important that we're comfortable with these hypothesis testing. So it has been claimed that 58.4% of web users prefer Chrome. However, you believe the number is lower. 
So you're going to test it. You sample 152 web users. And 74 of them use Chrome. With alpha equal to 0.01 this time, we want to be very confident. We're going to go all the way down to 1% error. What can you conclude? Well, like before, let's start with our hypotheses. The no hypothesis is that the proportion equals what they claim it equals. The claim is that it equals 0.584. The alternative hypothesis is based on what you're trying to show. And this time, we're going to try and show that the actual number is lower, that the proportion is less than 0.584, which means this time we really have a one-tail test, or better said, a left-tailed test, meaning we're going to reject the null hypothesis if we end up far out into the left tail. Drawing a picture, the hypothesized mean is at 0.584. We're going to reject if it's less than significantly to the left or in that left tail. So we have our distribution. We know that the proportion is normally distributed at 0.584 with a standard error of, using the null hypothesis, 0.584 times q, which is 0 0.419, oops, 416, sorry, divided by the sample size of 152, which means it's normally distributed at 0 0.584, comma, 0 0.0400 when we round. If that's the distribution, then we're going to compare it to the proportion, or the p hat, that we get from our sample. Our sample said 74 out of 152 use Chrome. 74 out of 152 is 0.487. That's the value off to the left. It's less than 0.487, where the shading starts. Is that far enough away that we can make a conclusion that it's actually less than? Well, to do that, we will go to our z value, which is equal to our sample proportion of 0.487 minus the hypothesized proportion of 0.584 divided by the standard error of 0.0400. Our z value is negative 2.43. So we've got our x's on our picture putting those all into z's. The mean is 0, and the z value of negative 2.43 is where the shading starts. Let's go to our z table. And I got to scroll down a bit to see 2.43. So 2.43. Looks like this time we're going to have a z value of 0.49, I'm sorry, an area of 0.4925. But that's the area in between of 0.4925. We need the area in the tail, which is just 0.5 minus that, or 0.0075.
This time we don't need to worry about the other side because it is a one-tail test. So my p-value is just that shaded area, the 0 0.0075, which means based on our survey, there is a 0.75% chance the null hypothesis is true, or the proportion of Chrome users, or people who prefer Chrome, probably would have been a better way to say that, is 58.4%. That is really, really small p-value. In fact, what's really important is when we compare that p-value to our alpha of 0.01. It is actually less than that alpha of 0.01, which means that's too much evidence to the contrary. So we will make a decision to reject the null hypothesis. And the reason for that decision is because the p-value, the probability it's true, is less than the alpha, or specifically 0 0.075 is less than the 0 0.01 minimum threshold. So our conclusion? If we reject the null hypothesis, we will say that there is sufficient evidence to conclude. And then we will state the alternative hypothesis in context, focusing on being less than the 0.584. To conclude, the proportion of web users who prefer Chrome is less than 58.4%. One last little thing as we wrap up our conversation on hypothesis testing is when all is said and done, we make a conclusion based on a p-value. What's the probability that it's the null hypothesis is true? Do we ex reject it? Do we fail to reject it? But when all is said and done, at the end of the day in statistics, we could be wrong. And we really have no way of knowing if we're right or wrong. We can be fairly confident, 95% or 99% confidence, but we could be wrong. And there's two types of errors in statistics that we always try and minimize. We call them type 1 and type 2 errors. A type 1 error is when we reject the null hypothesis when it is true. We should not have rejected it, but we did. The probability of that happening is actually the alpha that we're using in the problem. The other type of error is what's called a type 2 error. And that's where we fail to reject the null hypothesis when we should have, when it is false. And the probability is not as evident for that. We call that probability beta. It comes up in more advanced statistics classes. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But you should be aware at this point of what a type 1 and type 2 error is in context. So we did two examples today. The first example
was about iPhones. And we failed to reject the null hypothesis. We could have committed a type 2 error, where we conclude not reject or fail to reject when we should have. Or to put it in context, and this is probably a better way to say it, or we believe the proportion of iPhone users is 43% because we failed to reject it, but we should have when it is not. It is not actually 43%. We should have rejected. That's a type 2 error. The second example, because we did reject, could have been a type 1 error, where we conclude reject when we should not have. Or to put that in context, we currently, after running that sample, we believe the proportion uh, who prefer Chrome is less than 58.4%, because that's what we concluded. But it's not. That would be a type 1 error, where it's actually either equal to or possibly greater than 58.4%, and we made the wrong conclusion. Those errors hopefully don't happen often to us, but there's always a chance that they could happen. Because with hypothesis testing, we're never sure of anything. We could be wrong. And that's what the type 1 and type 2 errors tell us, is what does it mean if we're wrong? So we covered a lot of stuff in this video today. We introduced the concept of what a hypothesis test is and how hypothesis test works. And then we did several hypothesis test examples in the context of proportions. And then really briefly at the end, we talked about we could be wrong, the type 1 and type 2 error. So take a look at the assignment if you want to try a few of these. A little bit of a longer video, but some of the next few are going to be much shorter to make up for it. So we'll see you in class.